in the screens that you can see in the in you can see Nigel Cossey, the uh, TUC Southwest uh, Secretary. He's there, and in you can also see Tom Dewitt, who is better known as Tolpuddle Tom, who's actually based in Tolpuddle and who runs the museum and and the shop there for the TUC. Now uh, this evening is all about Tom. Thanks, Les. That's brilliant. So yes, here I am in the Tolpuddle Museum. So I'm actually going to take you on a journey around Tolpuddle. I'm Tolpuddle Tom, and I'm standing here in an empty field in Dorset. Now, in any normal year, right now, this very weekend, as I'm speaking, this place would be alive with activity. There would be marquees, big tents going up. There would be pipes, water pipes, electric cables being laid. There'd be people banging in fences. There would be a hive of activity. Lots of people, good friends. Sadly, today, we have an empty field and nothing happening. But I'm going to take you on a little tour around the Tolpuddle site and we're going to actually explore some of the background, some of the history of why we're actually here in this particular field every year. How this came to be and how that kind of relates to events of 1934, things that happened on the centenary of the martyr's story. And the particular part here that I wanted to pay attention to is the building that you can see in the background. You can see there's a roof with a couple of buildings behind the parked car. Now that building is the vicarage. So as I said, we're not gonna go through the whole martyr's story. I think that presuming we all know that, but we know the significance of the vicarage in the story and the significance of the vicar and his relationship with Francis. So the tree under which the martyrs met is literally within sight of that vicarage we can see there. So, uh, and that's the image from the 1934 book of the vicarage. And that is, of course, the vicarage where the windows were smashed after the trial. And we can just get a little glimpse of the vicarage there. Now, it actually is significant that the vicarage is a really, really nice house. That really is part of the story. Essentially, the vicar is almost being a bribe. Now, here we have the martyr's cottage. Um, uh, again, this is the room where the um, oath was sworn. So really, we're just doing a quick whistle stop to uh, around the village, the places in the village which are where the events actually happen. And that's on the 1934 plaque on the front of it. And in just a moment, we should be going next door to the cottage and seeing the old Methodist chapel. Which obviously the martyrs were involved in building themselves. And that is currently undergoing some work by the Tolpuddle Old Chapel Trust, with whom we're working in partnership. Now, just up from the chapel, we've seen there we're moving along to this is where we believe George Lovelace actually lived, not in the White Cottage, but essentially on the driveway, just to the left of the White Cottage, kind of just outside the garage door, as far as we are aware, kind of just around on that side was Lovelace's house. Now, just recently, Andrew Norman, who was the author of the book of George Douglas, he was actually posting some stuff in various newspapers. He seemed to be suggesting that he believed that the White Cottage itself was the house in which George Lovelace had lived. Uh, that's the cottage there. Um, that's kind of the turn of last century. That photo there was taken. But as far as we're aware, that actual house is not Lovelace's. He was kind of next door, but what we do all agree on, somewhere in that part of the village. Here we back are, here we are back at the top of the time, and these buildings were all built in 1934 on the centenary. And as we saw, as we were down at the tree and in the village, there really wasn't any place to build anything on this kind of scale in the village. So this was a vacant plot at the west end of the village. Uh, and actually it was sort of partially acquired uh, with assistance from Sir Ernest Debenham and the Cooperative Society. But the TUC 
uh, actually kind of built this as part of a whole program of events that we're going to be having a, a really brief look at. Um, again, there has been one of these radical history tour things specifically on the events of, of, of 1934, the TUC's choice, so I'd, I'd recommend you have a look at that. So that's the cottages as they were built, and that's the, the, the memorial. And one thing we will see is these places, it wasn't just intended to be a museum or houses, it was intended to be somewhere where rallies could be held. Actually, it is a kind of a political venue from the very outset. We can see here some of the, um, the press coverage uh, and the images from when the place was actually opened up. And inside the museum, we've actually got some of the stuff there. And if you look there, you see that the Trade Union Congress was actually held in Weymouth in 1934, which is quite a thing. And just off to the left of that play, Six Men of Dorset was actually written as part of the centenary commemorations. And um, what we've actually got here are some medals, which were from some of the events which were held here, well, not just in Tolford, but in Dorchester as well. So uh, the literature, they all come down to Dorchester. Um, I must say, I really like the, the kind of visual graphic style of some of this stuff. I think the tank top is a, a kind of fashion statement that uh, we don't see enough of these days. Um, but um, we can see there, that's the top of town, the old keep, uh, uh, the little keep, sorry, in the distance. And that's at Moundbury Rings there. So we can see there was a whole raft of um, celebration and activity. We've actually got a page here from the guidebook, and on the right, that's actually the Czechoslovakian uh, kind of movement and gymnastics team and the folk dancing team. So we've actually got people coming over from Czechoslovakia for the, um, uh, the centenary celebrations. Um, and the actual architecture itself, is also fascinating because it was actually designed by Raymond and Edward Unwin, father and son. Raymond actually had worked, he had actually been tutored by William Morris. Um, so they built a kind of classic arts and crafts style. We can see the plans there as they were laid out, the buildings. Um, and they were intended to be six homes for former agricultural workers. And even that in itself is a kind of political gesture. Um, we'll talk a little bit about his, his foundations going up because it was political gesture because um, the doctor workers would routinely be thrown out of their tired accommodation when they came to the end of their working lives or if they were injured. Um, so it was a really significant thing to build these kind of decent homes. And we can see the places going up here. It's, and, and I find these pictures fascinating. I mean, this picture in particular, if we look in the background, you can actually see the slope, uh, the, the, the field in which the festival itself is hill, held. Slope, um, indeed, where many, many of us have actually camped. So it's kind of quite evocative to see what is a kind of recognizable site, but at the same time, uh, in, in, in such different circumstances. And here we have, this is Walter Citrine, who is actually, uh, at the time, the General Secretary of the TEC. Um, and we can see that even during the building process, the kind of publicity, the PR, the promotion, was in fact a really significant part of it. Um, we've got Lots and lots of really high quality photos being taken. We can see that, that chap was a pipe vendor. This is the team of electricians. So just the electricians team all lined up for picture. And here is the entire construction team. And one thing I think really fascinating about this is the young boys we see at the front are so the age range of the people building the building. And uh, that is Mr. Mr. A. Colney uh, of the uh, National Union of Agricultural Workers there. And on the left, in this picture here, we have, uh, that's George Lansbury, who was at the time leader of the Labour Party. Um, and we've got here George Lansbury with William Hammett, and that is actually James Hammett's son. So this is all part of the... Um, 
celebrations around it. But Lansbury is interesting also because he was father uh, of one of the, um, they were Angela Lansbury's father, sorry, but she was married to one of the councillors in the popular Popper case dispute, which was um, as featured in Deneen Booth's recent um, radical history. Tour. Um, and here we have Hammett's um, grave, uh, which obviously we see Lansbury there actually opening up um, in 1934. So this stone, the stone itself, was actually remade as part of the 1934 celebrations. And the stone itself was actually made by Eric Gill, um, a hugely controversial artist. Lots has been uh, said about his life. But I think in, in terms of what we're looking at this evening, what's really important is that he was a celebrity at the time that you see chose to um, employ him. Now, one of my favorite stories um, about the, um, uh, the, the gravestone is actually, this is where Jeremy Corbyn was down. Um, and um, uh, th there's two interesting things about this photo. Um, on this day, the, the Daily Mail actually ran a story um, where they were featuring, so obviously Corbyn uh, was not, should we say, universally liked by all sides of the party, very much on the left of the party. And there was someone more, I suppose, what you might say on the Blairite tendency, who was actually shouting some kind of heckling comments and the Daily Mail loved this and they picked up on the story. And the thing that tickled me most about the story is uh, the martyrs themselves were referred to as the so-called cold martyrs. And, and personally, I see that actually to get a so-called in the Daily Mail is almost um, what you might call a, a, a badge of pride. But what we've got here is after the kind of um, all of the events, building the cottages, recording the building of the cottages, the, the events when the cottages were opened and a mass fanfare that accompanied them. This is actually the first set of residents as they moved in. And again, we've got um, the citrine sitting in the center. And I think- well, well, the, big, the big thing about this picture for me is all of these people were born in the uh, 19th century, weren't they? Because all of these were retirees now. These are all reached the age of retirement. And that's why they're moving into these cottages. That's absolutely right, Les. And that brings me perfectly onto this next picture. Because even though the events are happening in 1934, some of the literature and the guy with his nice rolled up sleeves and his tank top inviting everyone down to Topado is so quintessentially 1930s. It's a real expression of 1930s trade unionism. This image, this is actually inside cottage number two, I believe, in the living room. And essentially this is a Victorian interior. And the furniture they have, I mean, uh, and so essentially, uh, as you were saying there, Les, these were Victorian agricultural labourers moving into these cottages for the first time. And I don't think looking at the kind of arts and crafts exterior, you would actually imagine um, that the inside would really look quite like this. But the other thing I think this picture shows is, uh, and I, you know, I'm kind of slightly cautious saying this because obviously they were built with, you know, incredibly noble intentions to highlight the housing problems of working people, highlight the problems of um, tied cottages and raise the standard of housing for working people generally. But at the same time, as part of that, the people who went in to some extent, they are living in a goldfish bowl. Um, we can see that, you know, they are posing for those photos, whether they yeah. like it or not. No, they are. And, and this is what, one of the things that strikes me about this immediately is the uh, is this lovely sort of needlework box on the table in the front, you know, and she's sitting there doing her needlework while oh, her, yeah. husband, I, her husband, I presume, is, is reading the paper, which is a very worthwhile uh, hobby to be doing when you've retired, reading, reading the paper. Yeah, there's it a almost, nice writing. I, I would also say that while they're doing those things, 
They are being observed. We are looking at this picture. And, you know, you can almost imagine people with their noses pressed against the window, looking in at the agricultural labourers. Um, they're, they're almost the first exhibits, if you like. Didn't the early inhabitants complain about that as well? And then one of them started giving tours. Well, I think one of them actually started giving tours. That's uh, right. And there was some, there was some altercation amongst the, the residents there. Yes, uh, a, a tradition that might well have continued. Um, uh, but um, this is another picture. Now, this picture, uh, I, I'm sorry to say, uh, it, it really actually makes me smile because if we take forward this idea of people being under scrutiny, people being on display, and almost this entire development is actually a statement in itself. We see here, this is the cottages illuminated at night by powerful electric floodlights, as it says. And you can almost imagine looking at that light. They're the kind of old factory spot lamps that would, that the kind of transformer would make a thud as the switch is pulled. Uh, and you know, heaven knows what kind of wattage uh, they're using. And as it says there, it could be seen for many miles around. And as an observer remarked, how indicative it is of the rise of the working class movement. Tolpado, once dark and depressing, now sends out a gleam for all to see. And I just think of those poor residents in the second window in, sitting there trying to read their newspaper or get to sleep, and this kind of bright light beaming in from outside. You know, it, it, you wouldn't be able to hide from that light anywhere you go. So that does kind of, it makes me laugh a little bit, I must say. So yeah, that's Thompson Dagnall. It's actually a, a competition uh, to build the sculpture. And, um, yeah, it's an interesting sculpture because it kind of combines uh, kind of traditional and modern uh, aspects because obviously it's a, it's a nice depiction of George Douglas himself. So this cottage here is a house called Rosedean and it's in a village called O'Connorville, which is just outside Birmingham. And this was built by Fergus O'Connor, who was one of the leading members of the Chartist movement. And the significant thing that you can already see looking at it is the substantial vegetable plot, which is in front of the, um, the cottage. It was a development of a hundred similar cottages. And obviously you'll be aware that the, one of the significant things around Chartism was to abolish the land owning qualification uh, for entitlement to vote. Uh, and what, the purpose of this development, each house actually came with an acre of land. So basically, anyone getting one of these houses would become entitled to vote. So they were built by a kind of a lottery distribution. So people pitched in their money and the development itself would create a hundred voters. And where that's, this linked into the later Tolpado cottages is a big part of it each cottage was provided with a substantial barn and a piggery. And as well as the ability to vote, it was also set out in the philosophy of these buildings that if you could become self-sufficient, if you could actually grow and produce your own food, you then would not be um, subject to the requirements of having to buy your food sometimes off the very people that employed you. So to some extent, you're actually undoing some of the damage that was done by enclosure, because obviously pre-enclosure, the commoners, the, the, the people in, in, in the villages, had the ability to grow limited crops, had the ability to keep certain animals on land and also had the ability to collect firewood and that was taken away and those were all obviously the factors that made life untenable for the rural poor leading up to the Tolpado martyrs dispute. So the concept of having enough space is critical and one of the things that was Kind of a significant part of these houses here is each house actually has a really generous garden and each house 
has a really substantial shed, uh, a beautifully built timber and wood kind of arts and crafts style shed out the back. So what they were really doing, providing people um, with the means to largely produce their own food, and we've got six houses here, don't forget. So those people would probably have all grown different produce in their own gardens. They would have undoubtedly spoken to each other. So they would have also been able to kind of swap and barter. So within the community itself, they would have actually been able to be, if not completely, but certainly relatively self-sufficient. And the other Ernest Everton connection is he was actually involved in building the village of Bryant's Puddle, that the arts and craft houses there. Again, each one of them also has a very substantial garden, almost a kind of small holding. And again, a very significant shed. So the kind of whole arts and crafts thing, how it fits in to these buildings is really significant. Um, and it's, oh damn, I, I wish I did have pictures of the sheds that we've got here because the sheds, are one of my favorite things. This is the museum when it was built. So originally it wasn't intended to be a museum. It was intended to be a kind of a reading room uh, uh, and, uh, and a kind of common room. Um, and that evolved into a museum over time. But there's part of the site here I've got a kind of love-hate relationship with. Um, and that is the sewage treatment plant. Now, I think I'll actually show you. In one of the corners of the building, we've got a kind of septic tank. Um, and that is coming to the end of its life. We're actually, over the next couple of years, we're going to be engaged in completely replacing that. But when we think that that was put in in 1934, and rather than using new technology, I'm going to use old technology. Can you see that? Can you see that, Nigel? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, there we are. This is, in fact, the original kind of art engineer's it's not really the engineer's drawings, this is kind of the instruction sheet that came with the sewage treatment plant in 1934. Tuke and Bell Limited, which is still kind of proudly cast into the ironwork of the thing itself. And we have, even though, as I say, it is a sewage treatment plant, this absolutely beautiful line drawing. Um, and on the back, we've actually got here dates, 1954, February, 1955, 1956. Um, the kind of notes of the, of the site foreman with their work on the thing. So the fact that this has lasted so long is absolute testament to the quality of architecture, construction and engineering of this place. So when that finally goes, although I will breathe a great sigh of relief that I won't have to get involved in kind of unblocking the channels anymore or getting contractors to do that, I will kind of be sad, so I'm definitely keeping this for the historic archives. And um, really, I, I guess that's kind of where I'll finish sort of the bit I'm talking about is the fact that these buildings, while they might now look almost just like relatively humble houses, in 1934, the concept of a home which is humble, but yet built to high standards with an indoor toilet, with decent bathrooms. And let's not forget in every village, there were more agricultural workers than there are now. The number of agricultural workers in villages, now the work's all done by contractors with large machines. But well, that's a good point, Tom. Because the next question from Marigold is which farmers now own the fields around the Top Hole Memorial Cottages and who negotiates the use of them each year? Right, well, I mean, the farmers, I mean, there's been some change, but the land, the land ownership patterns have changed remarkably little in Dorset. I mean, Frampton himself, his descendant, still owns hundreds and hundreds of acres. And obviously Drax himself, Richard Drax, local MP, uh, who in fact will be scrutinised slightly, I think, during the forthcoming festival, is the largest landowner in Dorset. To answer the question about the land and negotiating, it, it has been a sore point over many years. The, the two main families who own the land around the site are the, the King family and uh, the descendants of the Woodhomers who own the land on which we have the festival. 
interestingly, at the time they were employing the martyrs, uh, they were considered the sort of better employers, if, we, if that could be a fair description. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's always been um, an issue about how do you negotiate car parking with landowners who may not entirely share your views. And we're grateful for the village and the, the King family for, um, for allowing us to use the, their land. Um, for me? But yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for this evening. Uh, I enjoyed it. What we made.